Hello, everybody, officially, and thank you for coming to the San Francisco Users Group meeting today in August. We're really happy to start uh, doing these again. Um, I'm Robert Statzinger. I am a solution architect here at Elastic. I've been here for about nine or 10 months. I, I work in the field. Uh, I, I pair up with um, some of our strategic uh, account reps, but my other job is just as an articulator, a teacher, a communicator, and that's what I'm here to do tonight. So this is 100% this is content. There's no sales tonight at all. We're just here to talk about good stuff. And what we're gonna talk about is vector search. And um, I wanted to start with a little bit of an introduction. First of all, um, the, the person who organizes our community and, and, and sponsors the meetups is Olivia Petrie. Uh, I was hoping she was gonna be able to be here, uh, but unfortunately she is, she's not. She's based in Denver and she's the one who does the coordination and outreach for our meetups and the in, uh, users groups. Some of you have already met Haley Hoops. She's the uh, workplace experience coordinator here in San Francisco. She put uh, together all the logistics. Uh, and then there's me, who's the talking head for today. Um, Samantha is also here, which is great. Uh, and um, you know, we're we're uh, a company of about three thousand people at this this uh, stage of the game. Uh, but we're really, really, really big on continuing to nurture the open source community and the people who use uh, the platform and contribute and grow it and do interesting things with it. So that's definitely really, really important. Uh, and uh, let me thank you all personally for your continued work and innovation with the product. So just a little housekeeping, first of all, this is conversational. Feel free to interrupt me with questions. It's a relatively small group here. So if you've got any questions, feel feel free. Um, I'm not guaranteeing I can answer all of them, um, but um, we can certainly discuss them. We have plenty of time. This is completely relaxed. Um, hopefully some of you already know we have a discussion forum out there also. I, I see some nods. That's great. I encourage you to Continue, continue to contribute there, both to ask questions and to lend your expertise. So thank you all for that. So in terms of an agenda uh, for what we're gonna do here today, I, I hope this won't go too long because I know we all want to get to the refreshments, but we're gonna, we're gonna talk about a little bit of an overview uh, of vector search. Uh, we're gonna talk about use cases, why, why we wanna do this. We'll talk a little bit about what it, what it means to compare vectors and, and vector similarity. We'll talk about how you can compare vectors and do vector, vector search at scale in the Elastic 8 platform. We'll um, have some getting started for you. This is not a hands-on workshop, but I can give you homework if you want. There's a full blog out there on how you can get started doing vector search basically just by, by following a step-by-step -step log that our engineers put out there. Uh, we'll cover some additional resources and discussion, and then we'll socialize for a while. So uh, I'd like to start with a little bit of a poll. How, how familiar are you, are you guys already with vector search out there? N not at all, kind of, sort of, you know a lot kind of five, sort of a five, sort of a one or two, sort of a one, sort of a one, one, two, three, four. Okay, all right, there's a, there's a range of responses here. That, that's great, that, that's very helpful. Um, so vector search is this notion of changing the way search works, right? Generally search and, and improvements to search have in the past been focused on sort of making text-based search more clever. You're still searching with strings, right? But you add things like analyzers and stemming and so forth, but you're still sort of comparing strings to each other. Vector search goes beyond that, right? Vector search says, 
let's find ways for you to do deeper representations of meaning and content, right? You're actually going to try to compare things and not strings. And it allows you to, to base similarity based on these other attributes, right? Deeper representations of meaning in content. And it does this by encoding the data as series of vectors, bunches of numbers. And these numbers come from these notions of deep learning models. So the idea is machine learning lets you encode data as a series of numbers. And then you have mathematical ways of comparing these vectors to each other to determine similarity that results in very nuanced ways of comparing data that really would be difficult or impossible when you're just comparing strings to each other. So this, this notion of, of encoding data into vectors is governed by deep learning techniques, such as neural networks, transformers, and so forth, whose job it is to take data and represent it in a vector space as a set of numbers. But it doesn't do this willy-nilly. It organizes the data into a set of vector spaces that represent relationships between the data, right? And these, these techniques are at the heart of machine learning. And you know, there's a wide variety of ways to develop and train these models to generate vector spaces that model representations in the data. And the good news here is that these techniques are becoming ever more democratized. And it used to be that you really had to be a specialist in machine learning to do a lot of this kind of stuff. But in Lucene 9 and in Elastic 8, Anybody who has a basic working knowledge of a platform can start to take advantage of that research. So why, why do people want to do this? Well, let's face it, context matters here, right? Why is it so easy for a human to understand when someone says, call me a cab? Human beings know from the context, it's very easy for us to understand whether well, the correct response is not, okay, you're a cat, but it's deceptively difficult to get computers to understand this context, this nuance in natural language. You can also see that sometimes it's not at all clear why a couple of images might be similar. Why are these two rabbits similar? There's nothing really overt in the shapes, the colors and so forth that would make them similar, yet we know that they are. There's some deeper representation of similarity that you have to try to model here, right? So when you want to be able to, to, to have these kinds of deeper representations of content, of meaning, and you want to be able to re do relevance ranking according, you know, when you want to search and have search results ranked by meaning, and you want to do, you know, query un unstructured natural language and, you know, have multimedia searches on images and audio. There are also there are also types of data such as data in cybersecurity where you will see that some of this data actually originates in vector form and it's very easy to work with. You with me so far? Okay. So how does this work then? Let's talk a little bit about the mechanics. Well, as we've said, that this notion of vectorizing data is achieved using techniques such as neural networks, and transformers that generate models of the data that say, all right, I'm going to take this string sentiment and trans translate it into a, some sort of a vector. And it organizes the data into these searchable spaces. And there's a lot of techniques. There's, you know, models such as word to vec and glove for word embedding and for language models there's BERT and so forth then you know for images you have convolutional neural networks you know for for sound you have Fourier transforms that can generate spectrograms and so forth so you have a variety of ways of taking different data types and generating feature vectors you know that you can use in training models and the key point to remember here is that you're not just creating vectorized data willy-nilly. You're creating data that is modeled in spaces that represent classifications, groupings, you know, they, they model the relationships between the data. So the data that you want to be classified as similar to each other, for example, end up in similar locations in face space. 
And in case that discussion wasn't clear, we're going to talk about a simple representation of how this actually works uh, in practice. So this is a very, very oversimplified representation of, of vector search here. Imagine we were trying to classify images here, and we have this dimension. And this dimension is how cartoonish or realistic an image might be. OK? So this realisticness or cartoonness, we assign it a number. An image, an image gets assigned a value, some floating point number on this dimension. And we can also, we could, we could add a second dimension. We could say, let's also ascribe a value to an image based on whether it's mammal-like or bird-like. Okay. So now we have two dimensions along, we, along which we can assign numbers to images. And images processed into the model were given a score along these axes. So it's like a Cartesian graph, right? So this simple process then allows us to classify different kinds of images along a few dimensions. You know, a cartoon bird, we know a cartoonish bird or a cartoonish bird-like object. We know kind of where it's going to live in this space. We know sort of where a realistic-ish bird is going to live in this space. And we know where sort of a, a realistic-ish or a cartoonish elk is going to be classified in this space. Now we can search. And the thing to remember about this is when you query this, when you want to search, the query is also vectorized. You have to search vectors with ve vectors, right? So let's say you have this image. And you want to say, what does this image look like in the images I've already classified the story? Well, you run the image through a model, it comes out as a, as a vector. Then you can do highly optimized vector search. And you can rank results by similarity. And that looks like this, OK? So we, we, we input an elk to the model, an elk gets vectorized. It's computed for nearest neighbor search. And we relevance rank by similarity, the most similar elk, second most similar elk, and so forth. The same kind of relevance, the same kind of search relevance results you get with other kinds of search with, our, with the platform. Is this making sense? And this opens up a variety of interesting use cases. So probably the most well-developed use case for vector search is natural language processing, question answering, sentiment analysis, a variety of others. They all work on these models that vectorize natural language and allow you to do classification, search, and different kinds of analysis. And again, this moves beyond these bag of words algorithms, you know, such as BMF 25 and so forth. This is beyond that. This is using deeper representation of meanings that are encoded into vectors. You know, those, those bag of words approaches don't really tell you anything about meaning. Okay. For e commerce, there are use cases such as recommendation engines and personalization ads that vector search greatly facilitates. We already talked about image and audio search. And then it turns out, and I have to do some research on these examples, in cybersecurity, there are certain kinds of data that actually um, occur naturally as vectorized data. So vector search is a natural approach to using this data. I saw Samantha nod there. Is there, is there something you can add to that? <laughs> This is supposed to be an open discussion. If I'm telling lies or if you have questions, I, I encourage uh, discussion here. So if you're, if you're going to do this, you have to have well-defined ways of comparing vectors. You got all these, this data, you classified it, you stored it in a model. How are you going to search it? Well, you have to be able to compare vectors to each other. But there's different ways of doing that. And in this particular example, the similarity of, of vectors depends on how you measure. If you measure the endpoints, 
the distance between endpoints of the vectors, you're going to get one answer. In that case, the red and green vector are definitely more similar because the distance between their endpoints is smaller. But if you measure the angle between vectors, if that's what you're after, then red and blue are more similar. So you have to take that into account when you're defining when you're building your model. You have to define how your vectors are going to be compared to each other. And in fact, you can you can see that. That, that's really important in the platform too, because when you define indexes in Elastic, in Elastic 8, to use for vector search, you have to specify the similarity measure that's going to be used for those dense vectors. That's going to, that's going to be a fundamental piece of how efficient uh, nearest neighbor search is going to happen for you. So. In, in Elasticsearch 8, you'll see that there are three different measures you can use for similarity. Probably the most uh, common one is cosine similarity. You're just measuring the angle. When vector length is not important, cosine similarity is what you're going to use, right? So in the example of your cosine similarity is obviously going to result in B and C being judged as the most so Nearest neighbors are pointed to the cosine angle. Euclidean distance is also available. That's just the distance between the tips of the vectors. That's obviously, in this case, going to make A and B closest to each other. The dot product is actually an interesting one. The dot product takes into account the cosine of the angle as well as the length of the angle. So when you're, when you're designing your applications, this is a choice you're going to, you're going to make based on your use case. And when you create, when you use like, the, here's an example from the 8.3 API. You create an index, the specification of a vector, uh, a vector field, the type is dense vector, the number of dimensions, three is very small. In actual practical applications, the number of vectors, vector dimensions is probably going to be in the hundreds or even more. So that, that simple example I showed you was a very simple example. You're definitely going to have vector uh spaces in the in the hundreds or more and by the way in practical applications those vector dimensions aren't going to have names like thirdness nanoness or newness or thirteenness those dimensions are just going to be nodes inside of the node that are assigning values to vectors based on the weights between the nodes we don't know what they're doing but they're working you have to assign index to true Okay, and then you assign a similarity measure. And then you're off and running. And then you're prepared to do vector search at scale. How does this actually work in the platform? Well, in 7.3, we introduced a brute force search. Welcome, sir, thank you for coming. Uh, in 7.3, we, we, we introduced the dense vector field, uh, and you could calculate the similarity of a query vector to every vector in the database and rank by a script score that used a vector function, right? So the time, the, comp the compute complexity of that calculation is on the order of the size of the data set multiplied by the number of vector dimensions. So while it will give you exact results, it's not going to scale to realistic size data sets. Right. So in eight, particularly in 8.3, we've introduced approximate nearest neighbor search. Okay. It retrieves a good guess of the K nearest neighbors, sacrificing a little accuracy, a little accuracy for huge performance gains and good functionality on large data sets. And the approach we chose is this hierarchical navigable small worlds. Okay, this is a very common regime for approximate nearest neighbor search. It's native in Lucene 9. That was very important in our thinking. We wanted to do this based on the most native platform where we could. And in fact, we helped inject this into Lucene 9 and we're helping to nurture the feature. So what this is, this is kind of a multi-leveled graph approach to a search space. And as you may know in Elastic, 
we schema on right. This is kind of the equivalent of schema on right because this is used when we index the data. The way it works is that it starts at the top layer, which is very sparsely populated by items in your vector search space. The top layers are to make up speed quickly. You're not hopping around a lot of nodes. You're looking for a quick, a quick hit to get to the most likely area of the search space. When you run out of nearest neighbors at that level, you drop down. You drop down a level where you have more options. The deeper you go, the more accurate your results are. The higher you go, the faster your results are. So it's kind of a trade-off. You get a little slower, a little more accurate, a little slower, a little more accurate. And it uses a greedy search algorithm. Wherever it is in the process, it looks around to see where it is, if there are any nearest neighbors that are closer to its goal using the similarity measure to where it wants to go. If there's a nearest neighbor that's closer, it hops to that and continues to search. But if there isn't, if it's on the bottom level and there's nobody nearby that's closer to its goal, it says, okay, I'm there. And it collects the K nearest neighbors, sends them back to you ranked by similarity. And we, we're betting heavily on this as the regime for approximate nearest major search. We're um, enforcing correctness with things like deletions, where we've just added uh, filtering capability. This is the way we think this is the best approach for approximate nearest major search in the last. And uh, you know, we're continuing to improve indexing performance in this, um, in this regime. And we benchmark it. Do you guys know that we benchmark the product? You guys know that? We make them public. We put them out there. And I love it. I love that we do that because I want, I want our practitioners as well as our customers to see that we, you know, we ship a performant quality product. And you can see the results that we get with this sort of approach to approximate nearest neighbor search versus the script score methodology in the exact model. And this is, this is, you know, much higher performance. And here's an example. I don't know if you can read it. Uh, it's in the docs too. Uh, doing uh, an approximate nearest neighbor search on such a, such a vector field um, with a filter term. And, you know, we could have made other choices here. I mean, face is out there. NMS live is out there, but we wanted a platform native all Java solution so that we could integrate with all the rest of the features of the platform. You know, there might've been a little bit of a trade-off in speed, maybe against the C++ library, but we buy that back in compatibility with the rest of the platform and our ability to go it forward as native in the platform. So this, this kind of ties together the whole picture for doing vector search here. You've got a, a corpus, some set of data, a bunch of questions answered somewhere, a bunch of natural language stuff. You've got a model that you've built and trained. It could be Hugging Face, PyTorch, any of these. You can import the model and then do a test inference. Throw, throw an example or a piece of data into the model. Testing a pipeline. Spits out a bunch of vectors. You import the data, you use Pipeline, you re-index into an index configured for approximate nearest neighbor search, and you're ready to go. So as I said, you know, we're really, this is a big bet. We this is the way we're going on this. This is this is the horse we're riding. Um, we've just added filtering. Aggregations are coming soon. Uh, we're making ongoing improvements to indexing speed. Um, and we make this, this work is public. There's a public GitHub repo there. I encourage you all to check it out. Give us questions, comments, feedback on our approach. We listen. We listen. You guys are really, really, really important. Greetings. Come in. And uh, this is the lab work, which we're not doing tonight, but I'm gonna make sure you know how to do this. Um, 
This, as I said, is a blog written by engineering. It'll walk you through importing a model, testing the model with some data, importing a bunch of MS Marco question answering data, and then developing a, a pipeline and re indexing into a, uh, a 364 dimensional dense vector field in an index. And then showing you how to do approximate nearest neighbor search against that. And I will push the actual links. I know you can't, I don't know if you, you, you have the ability to assess this out here from the slide. But if you visit the meetup page later, I'll push the links for uh, the stuff in the meetup page. Elan is our machine learning client, by the way. Have you, has anyone here used Elan before? Okay, great. A couple of you. It's a, a Python client for machine learning for uh, importing models and other things, I'm sure. And it's really cool. It's free and open. Everything we talked about here today is free. So um, additional resources, of course, um, our documentation, a few blog articles, the benchmarks I've discussed. I'll try to make these slides or a PDF available in the, in the meetup room. I know there's a lot of content here. And lastly, I want to point out that this is just the beginning. We're really, we're, um, we love meetups. And this office is here for those reasons. So on September 29th and October 19th, there have been two more scheduled. I don't know yet what the topics are, but I think Olivia will be uh, pushing that out into the uh, meetup. Uh, to and And you know what? Put your suggestions out there. If there are things you want us to talk about, let us hear from you. Put them out in the meetup. Put them out in the discussion forum. Or email me. There's my business card over there. I've enjoyed this. Thank you.